taking us uh, through the land of 10,000 lakes this morning. Thanks for having me. And this is NPR News. I'm Mike Mulcahy. 11 days to go until Election Day, and people in Minnesota's 8th Congressional District have a big decision to make. The seat in Congress is open after Democrat Rick Nolan announced his retirement, so now voters have to choose who will represent the area for the next two years. The district covers northeastern Minnesota and includes the cities of Duluth, Brainerd, Grand Rapids, and International Falls. It stretches from just north of the Twin Cities metro area all the way to the Canadian border. The Republican candidate is Pete Stauber. He's a St. Louis County commissioner, a former Duluth police officer, a business owner, and a former hockey player. The DFL candidate is Joe Radinovich. He's a former state representative who managed Rick Nolan's 2016 campaign and Jacob Fry's campaign for mayor of Minneapolis in 2017. Pete Stauber, Joe Radinovich, thanks a lot for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate this opportunity. Glad now, to be here, Mike. Uh, we won't have a lot of rules this hour. We're not running any stopwatches or anything like that, but the goal is to give you each a fair chance to state your positions on the issues, and we won't take calls, but I did ask the listeners in advance to send me some questions, and I hope to get to as many of those as possible. But let me start with a question of my own. Uh, Donald Trump was the first Republican presidential candidate to win the 8th District in a long, long time. He's a strong backer of yours, Pete Stauber. So tell us where do you most agree with the president, and tell us if there are any areas where you disagree with the president. You know, I, I, I agree with uh, President Trump's his, uh, his economic response. Uh, I, I agree with his, uh, he's got really good business sense, and he's propelling this uh, with his ad administration, uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, have really benefited the 8th Congressional District. And uh, as I'm going around the district, that's what I'm hearing, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act have benefited so many manufacturing facilities and small businesses like the one my brothers and I own. Uh, some of the places that I disagree with, uh, I've talked about this earlier, had I been in Congress just two years ago when uh, our president's uh, first budget went forth, Mike, I would have been the first one to stand up and uh, talk about zero funding for the Great Lakes Restorative Initiative that was in that initial budget. The Great Lakes are part of uh, our economy, and I would have fought fiercely to uh, ensure that that uh, funding uh, is fully funded. And so those are some things that, uh, that I would uh, uh, really fight uh, on behalf of the 8th District voters. The other thing is the ZTE Corporation. I know that uh, President Trump wanted to get into the with the uh, uh, at least talk about uh, some type of agreements with the Chinese government for the ZTE, the tech conglomerate, and I support uh, Congress uh, men and women on both sides of the aisle that said it wasn't a good idea. So I would have I would have uh, uh, supported the uh, Congress on that issue. Joe Radinovich, anywhere you agree with the president, anywhere you disagree strongly with the president. Yeah, well, I, you know, I recognize as a Democrat that the president's a Republican, and I have an obligation to go out and work uh, with him on issues that we have in common. And one of those issues that the president had identified during the 2016 campaign that I think a lot of us uh, value is important is an investment in infrastructure. Uh, we wanted a trillion-dollar package that would have put millions of people to work across the country, that would have revitalized our infrastructure. But here's the problem, is that the president has espoused a view that says that we should, and Pete supports this as well, that we should give 80 percent of the benefit of the tax bill that was passed in January to the top 1% of income earners. The problem is, is that, that that's going to lift the deficit to $1.1 trillion by next year. And in 400 hearings in the Congress on transportation, only five minutes was dedicated to talking about how we would afford and how we would pay for infrastructural investments. And so, you know, I... I, I feel it's a little bit disingenuous to say these things and then to not have a plan to do them. And, and Mike, I would like to respond to that. Um, infrastructure investment is critically important. And I can go, go back to my uh, time on the St. Louis County Board of Commissioners. I'm into my sixth year right now. We have invested heavily into infrastructure in St. Louis County, the road, the roads and bridges. We have 6,000 lane miles that we're responsible for. And to be able to invest in uh, our roads and infrastructure, invest in the over 300 bridges we're responsible for, that is something that's critically important. And Mike, that's why I want to go uh, to Congress to make sure that we have the investment in our infrastructure. Can, 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 and, that, and I just gave the example yeah. as a St. Louis County yeah. Commissioner what I did. Can you do that though with the deficit on the rise? Yeah, we know that uh, the, the deficit 
is uh, it's really a national security issue. And so what we have to look at is uh, ways to, uh, you know, cut the deficit and, and look at uh, what we're uh, uh, putting forth for our children. We have to be responsible for uh, this next generation, Mike. And, and by being responsible, we have to uh, look at where we spend, where the efficiencies in government are, and where the deficiencies are, and, and work from there. Joe so, Rodinovich. Yeah, here's the problem, Mike, is that Pete and I have had a number of times to debate, and in the last debate on KSTP, he claimed to care about the deficit that's going to increase to $1.1 trillion because of the tax cuts for the wealthiest people in this country, and we're not going to have an ability to pay for infrastructure now. And at the same time, the, uh, Pete's party, the Republican Speaker of the House, the Republican Senate Majority Leader, and the President's administration have all called for cuts to Social Security and Medicare as a result of the deficit. And so what I think uh, it is when somebody says that they want to do something and yet has no plan to do it, can't identify well, we have any to remember that the Those, Obama administration hey, had one at $13 a time, trillion. If, dollars. if you're going to talk, I mean, I'd like to hear your positions, but, you know, so far it's just been empty words, and that's been the well, problem with this campaign. Well, wait a minute, uh, Joe Radinovich. Uh, so are you pledging to never cut uh, Medicare, Social Security, or Medicaid if you get elected? I am pledging to never cut those programs. Pete Sauber, would you pledge never to cut those? Yes, programs? never. We, we will preserve, strengthen, and secure a Medicare and Social Security for those seniors that deserve them. But let's get back to the infrastructure thing. He talks about, uh, Joe talks about the, the deficit. Under our 44th president, $13 trillion in debt. Now, we can do better than that, and that's why I'm going to Congress. I want to look uh, and be a, a pi bipartisan uh, congressman and do what's best for the 8th Congressional District. So we, we know that our, our, our deficit, we have to get our spending under control. We don't we don't have a revenue problem in D.C. We have a spending problem. So and where are you now have a we now state. have a revenue problem. And yeah, so I'd like to actually hear where he cut spending. Do you want me to yeah. ask that? Yeah, Answer. where would you vote to so, cut spending? So, uh, you know, the president uh, just put forth that he wants uh, his directors and uh, his agency leaders to look at uh, uh, cutting spending. Now, it would be irresponsible. Where, Pete? It would be irresponsible finish, for me right now after thousands of pages of, uh, of uh, 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 budgets without having to look at them, it would be irresponsible for me to say we're going to cut here and here, here and here. What I would like to do is look at, uh, have the ability when I'm elected to go in and use a scalpel at certain areas of the budget, but it would be irresponsible for both, either Joe or I to say we're just going to blatantly cut. There's, we know there's waste, fraud, and abuse in this. Well, government. is there anywhere you, th that the government spends too much? Well, I can tell you that uh, under the agriculture bill, um, they have, uh, the government has identified under the SNAP benefits, Mike, under the SNAP benefits, a $5 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars of fraud. We want those benefits to go to the people that most need them. So that's just one area uh, that we can look at uh, uh, cutting the fraud part of uh, uh, the fraudulent uh, abuse. So we know there's waste, fraud, and abuse. And we know we certainly know there's, there's in a $4 trillion uh, government uh, budget, Mike, there's areas we can cut. So not naming one single area except for food stamps, and he talks about $5 billion. Here's the deal is that we have a, it tax, was the fraudulent we have a tax bill, Pete. Stamps. We have a tax bill, Pete, that was passed in January that's going to add $1.9 trillion to the deficit, and 80% of that money is going to the top 1% of income earners. And at the same time, people in your party have repeatedly identified that they want to cut Social Security and Medicare. You cannot Absolutely walk away from that. We not. don't need to send one Untrue. more person out there. The president that, just it is mentioned, true, Pete. Okay, it is true that Pete, just mentioned... Uh, this week, we are going to preserve and protect and strengthen Medicare and Social Security. Empty promises. <laughs> Gentlemen, I need you to speak one at a time because it's on the radio and it gets really confusing. Joe Radinovich, where would you cut federal spending or would you want to uh, repeal that tax cut? Yes, I would want to repeal uh, the tax cut that benefits the top income earners uh, in, in the country. And I think that middle class people deserve a tax cut. But here's the deal is that we can't fund programs like Social Security and Medicare. We can't fund college affordability. We can't fund health care in this country because people say that we don't have enough money. But when it comes time for tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, or when it comes time to fund foreign wars abroad to the tune of $6 trillion for the last two wars, there's always enough money for that. And what I believe is that we ought to be investing in Americans and making sure that people growing up in communities like Crosby, Arrington, or Duluth or in Cambridge have an opportunity to be successful in this country. And by giving away the money to the wealthiest income earners, we fail to do that. Pete, but Mike, I, the bottom line is the Tax Cut and Jobs Act has really incentivized and revigor reinvigorated this economy. Just this week, I was at the Aiken Ironworks in Aiken, Minnesota, 
uh, spoke to the owner, Jeff. He's owned it for 40 years. This is one of his best years ever. And when I asked him, I said, Jeff, how has the Tax Cut and Jobs Act affected you? He looked at me and smiled. He says, it's great because it has brought the tax rate down to 21%. They have profit sharing for their employees. And Jeff said, a week before Christmas, our employees are going to get a healthy bonus. That, that's the type of stuff that the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act has really helped. And okay. 25% uh, uh, correction, $2,500 on average for the Minnesota 8 family. That is real money. Joe Radinovich, that yeah. sounds pretty good. You want to re- repeal it. $2,500 as an average, uh, you know, is an average, right? So there are people who are going to make a lot less than that. And there are people who are uh, in the 1% who are going to get average tax cuts of $40,000 at the expense of programs like Social Security and Medicare. And it's great that Aiken Ironworks is able to give a bonus to the people, but the facts of the matter are that over uh, 100 times more money will be put into stock buybacks than into wage increases for workers in this country. Stock buybacks are a way that companies increase the share or the, the, uh, the price of their stock and enrich stockholders. It's a policy that is going to exacerbate the deficit and it's going to threaten programs that are vital for the security of communities like ours in the 8th Congressional District. Programs like Social Security, Medicare, health care, and college affordability. Mike, just this past weekend, I was at a brewery in Two Harbors, and I asked the same question to the owner. I said, how has the Tax Cut and Jobs Act helped you? And she said, per barrel of brewed beer, the federal tax went from $7 to $3.50. I said, how much is that saving your small brewery? She said, close to $70,000. That's real economic savings. They can invest in their uh, uh, employees. They can expand. So in Two Harbors, Minnesota, $70,000 is a lot of money. And I would ask Joe, which family would you like to uh, take the $2,500 from? Pete, we can protect middle class tax cuts without having tax cuts that benefit the top 1%. They are not uh, mutual, they are not exclusive. So you support the tax cuts? No, I support middle class tax cuts. These are not middle class tax cuts, Pete. 80% the of the benefit will go to the 8th district Pete, is middle class, Pete, Joe. The 8th district let, let, is middle class, Pete, but 80% of the benefit of this tax bill is going to go to the top 1%. And, Pete, 20? let me finish. Let me finish, Pete. And the deficit will balloon to $1.1 trillion. Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell, last week, the Senate Majority Leader, both Republicans, the President's own administration, have all said that, the, that their plan for the next session is to cut Social Security and Medicare. It's on the record. It's a fact. You cannot it's, deny that. Joe, Joe it's interesting you, you want to be a fiscal hawk when you voted for a $2 billion uh, tax increase for the state of Minnesota. And so it's kind of hypocritical for you to stand here. But the You're bottom right line... I voted for that, Pete. Bottom line is the tax... Let him respond, Pete. Yeah. The bottom line is the... Wait a minute. No. The bottom line is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has reinvigorated this co- economy. Small business owners like myself, Mike, really appreciate that. Pete, we can let me, let me address this. Let me address we this allegation. Okay, in let me, hold on, let me address this. And what's happening this is, is important. important. I need, I need one at a time. Point. A let me give me some time here, Pete. It, it's a re- Pete. Pete. $2 billion. You're going to accuse me of raising taxes $2 billion. I am guilty as charged. Here's the deal, that for eight out of 10 years, this state faced budget deficits. And rather than asking people who could afford the most to pay a little bit more so that schools like Crosby Arrington didn't have to cut half their, sh- let me finish, Pete, didn't have to cut half the shop classes. The issue here is that the 200, we increased taxes by 2% on income above $250,000 for joint filers. So if you made $260,000 after our tax increase, you paid an additional $200 in income taxes. That's a fact. I don't know most most people in the 8th District are not making $250,000 as a household, and they're g- going to be hurt Joe. by cuts to their schools. That's why we passed tax, Joe, t- tax increase in this. the state. taxpayers it's threw you out after one term. All right, let me, well, let me uh, just uh, remind everybody, you're listening to a debate uh, on the, re- the major party candidates for the uh, 8th Congressional District seat. Pete Stauber is the Republican, and Joe Radinovich is the DFLer, and as you can tell, they disagree on a few things. <laughs> so let me uh, bring up a question, change the subject a little bit, bring up a question from a listener. Is health care a right or a privilege? And if it, let's start there. Uh, Pete Stauber. You know, health care is an essential benefit uh, without, uh, without a doubt. It's an essential benefit uh, that is needed by every American in this uh, country. Joe Radinovich. 
Healthcare is a right in the richest and most productive country in the world, and we can't afford to let people pay $300 a vial for insulin, rationing their insulin, or making decisions about whether they can pay their health care bill. In Little Falls, there, there are farmers paying $40,000 on the individual market for health insurance. Uh, steel workers on the Iron Range are trying to bargain a fair contract where health care benefits are the sticking point. This is an issue that we have an ability to fix in this country. Every other country, uh, every other industrialized nation has gotten this right. We pay more per person than any other country in the world, and we have 30 million people who are still uninsured. And the fact of the matter is, is we're not going to be able to do this while we still have a profit motive in our health care system. We are the only country in the world, well, the only industrialized nation in the world that allows people to make a buck off somebody who's sick. The highest paid okay. health... Yeah. A listener asks, uh, so if you want Medicare for everyone, how much does it cost and where does the money come from after we just talked about a yeah. growing deficit? Well, so here's the deal is people are already paying health care expenses in this country right now. We pay $3.4 trillion, you know, annually right now at this point. We pay 18% of the entire economy of this country is wrapped up in health care spending. But no other nation has it like this, right? That's the problem is that Germany spends 12% of their GDP on, the, on health care and it's the next highest nation. We, what we can do is instead of having people pay uh, premiums to insurance companies where 13 to 18 percent of that is going into overhead, and we're seeing CEOs make $66 million uh, and not heal one single person, then the issue really becomes that public programs operate at a much more efficient level. And instead of paying $66 million to insurance executives, think about how many doctors and nurses or other health care providers that could pay for. All right, Pete Mike, Mike, Joe has zero credibility on health insurance. When he was in the legislature, uh, he was uh, one of the deciding votes uh, to bring us Minsure, which we know was an unmitigated disaster premiums skyrocketed. Th hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans were thrown off their health care, including those with pre-existing conditions. And so he wants the keys to the nation's health care. We know that uh, uh, the, his uh, Medicare for All scheme will not work. It'll be a budget buster. For those so people... Hold, hold on, Mike. Okay. For those people who are on employer-paid insurance, you're going to get thrown off. For our seniors that have toiled their entire life... Uh, from uh, waiting to get on Medicare, a, 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 a benefit that they were promised and they earned. And the veterans, like my wife, will be thrown off their health care altogether. And Joe, uh, when he tried to explain at the last debate how he was going to pay, pay for it, it was raising taxes. And, and the Washington Post gave him three Pinocchios for that. So what that, would that, you That's do? not true. Pete, the Washington Pete Post. Stauber, hang on just yeah. one second. Pete Stauber, what would you do then to make health care more affordable and more available? You know, first of all, Let's, let's uh, um, face it, there's not a red or a blue playbook. There's not a Republican or a Democrat that has the monopoly on the good ideas. Mike, what I want to do is start with things we can agree on. And I think Joel uh, agrees that uh, pre-existing conditions should be covered. We need to look at associated health plans for small businesses like myself, Mike, that can pool our resources together and have the opportunity to uh, ha have uh, our employees have affordable health insurance. We need it affordable accessible and of quality. And just last week, uh, Mike, I spoke to physicians and hospital administrators, and they said Joe's plan would be devastating, not okay, only for the state I've of heard, Minnesota. I heard your criticism of his plan, though, but I'm trying yeah. to figure out what you would do. You, yeah, I just talked about it. Let's start oh. from where we things we can agree on and work out. We know that uh, we need it affordable, accessible, and of, quali of quality. But we don't need to take a sledgehammer to our health care system. Joe's the same. Joe and his allies were the same group that said, uh, if you want your doctor, you can keep him. If you like your plan, you can keep it. We know there are some good things in the Affordable Care Act, and I think we start from there. So you wouldn't repeal it? No, because there's, we don't have anything in place that uh, is Would better at this point. Would the Republican health care plan? So, okay. so, what, so what we need to do, Mike, is as we, as we go forward, really have a bipartisan effort and not care which political party gets the credit okay. uh, and let's, do what's right for the American let's people. Have Joe in yeah, so I, there's a number of things in there that are worth addressing. The first is that not everybody agrees that associated health care plans are a good way to go. In fact, many experts think that that's exactly the problem is that what, what we'll end up with is junk coverage, which is the problem that we had before the Affordable Care Act. I, my, my stepdad's a self-employed electrician, right? For all of his life, he was buying plans that were offering insufficient coverage. Why? Because they were the only plans that he could afford. And so what the Affordable Care Act did was that it made sure that every plan was going to carry uh, certain protections in it so that it would be a useful plan. It increased price, but it also brought people with pre-existing conditions into the pool, and it, it allowed them to pay a rate that wasn't higher than everybody else, which is the issue that people with pre-existing conditions have. Here's the deal, is that the Republicans tried to pass a health care plan this last year that Pete refuses to take a position on, 
that would endanger 275,000 people with pre-existing conditions just in our district alone. It would make coverage unattainable or unaffordable. I want to say one more thing, too, about this, which is that um, when we talk about universal health care, which Canada has, which the European nations have, which even Mexico has, when we talk about universal health care like that, what that means is that everybody will have coverage. Everybody will have basic coverage. So it's disingenuous to Pete to say that we'll be kicking people off their plans. Yes, we'll be eliminating some of those plans, but exactly. everybody will, everybody will have coverage. That people really everybody like. will have coverage. Yeah. Okay, and, and he just admitted it, it's going to eliminate plans. And that's what I just said. It's going to kick people off their health insurance that, have, that their employees paid for. You have to remember when, when Joe comes up and starts talking about this, he has zero credibility. He brought us the, the worst uh, health care disaster in the state of Minnesota that we're still digging out of. And But you wouldn't repeal that. And? And, uh, Mike, a, and Mike, okay. he voted to give Minsher executives taxpayer-funded bonuses when the system was, when Minsher was burning up and the websites were broken. I had, I have just talked about the things we can agree on, Mike. Start with they, that. We can't it, agree it, on it, those things, Pete. <laughs> You, Experts you, don't you agree don't, on those things. You don't agree on pre-existing conditions? No, I do, but here's okay. the thing. is My, my, my party has there. a plan. Let's Your start party from there. has voted to endanger people with Absolutely pre-existing conditions. Not. Republican you, governors Minsher are suing kicked, so that they don't have to cover Minsher people with pre-existing kicked, conditions. Minsher kicked the administration several hundred okay, I need you, thousand I need, people off, Joe. You kicked several hundred thousand people off their insurance when you voted for Minsher, including pre-existing conditions. You know, my wife and I have a 16-year-old son with Down syndrome. And I've this is our fourth debate, and I've told Joe this. I will require insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions. My son is born with two of them. I have a nephew at age two who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes through no fault of his own. Why should he suffer the rest of his life? So okay. Joe continues the to, global pr- to association. propel the myth. Hang on. Joe continues to propel the myth that Pete Stauber uh, doesn't support p- pre-existing conditions. And I do. Okay. I, I've told but a lot of The global association of, people, uh, of advocates for those with Down syndrome came out against the Republican health care plan because it would endanger people with pre-existing conditions, making their health care unaffordable or unattainable. What we can do is we can sit here and talk, but the, the, the reality and the facts on the ground are that the president's own administration is expanding waivers so that these insurance companies don't have to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Wrong. Words are, no, that's not wrong. It's a fact. You can wrong. Google it, Pete. You can literally look this up. Wrong. These are... Okay. <laughs> that's... <laughs> wrong. I need these you to talk one at a time, these though. These are seriously. cheap talking points. Let's Pete. just have some... Let's Let's, let's just be a little more civil. Go ahead, Joe, finish up. Yeah, so these, what we have are words and we have actions. And words are not matching the actions when it comes to Republicans on health care. The president's administration just last week is expanding access to waivers so that people or that insurance companies in, in many states won't have to cover people with pre-existing conditions. The, um, the Republicans uh, tried to pass a health care bill that would endanger 275,000 just in the 8th congressional district pre-existing conditions. There are words and then there are records and the words are not matching the records in this particular case for Pete and the Republicans. Pete Stauber. Uh, Joe's got a reckless record in the Minnesota House uh, for bringing us men sure. That's period. That's just uh, the facts. Uh, his 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 uh, reckless vote on uh, two reckless votes on men sure. He's got zero credibility as I've stated. I want to be able to work on both sides of the aisle to ensure that every Minnesotan has affordable, accessible, and quality health care. Talk that's, about empty talking points. That's Pete Stauber and Joe Radinovich. Uh, they are the candidates for Congress in Minnesota's 8th District. Uh, let me change the subject from health care and uh, go to another question I got from a listener. And I'm, I think you both have probably heard this one before. Where do you stand on copper nickel mining on public lands or in environ, environmentally sensitive areas? And I think specifically they're talking about the Twin Metals Project, which is proposed to be just a couple miles from the Boundary Waters. And uh, Pete Stauber, let's start with you. Yeah, I'm the only candidate that says, uh, and I've, had, I've said this for a while, I support iron ore mining, copper nickel mining, and Enbridge Line 3. You see, Mike, using a 21st century technology, we can have great paying jobs and mine copper nickel. Every company that wants to mine copper nickel must meet or exceed every single uh, federal environmental standard and every single state environmental standard. Otherwise, they don't mine. But you're saying there's no area off limits if they can meet those requirements. Well, there is. The, 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 your, the Boundary Waters has a buffer area. 
You know, uh, we, we can do both. Look at the economic Im- impact uh, uh, as an example uh, f- that that PolyMet can bring. The the fact of the matter is, uh, Minneapolis held the Super Bowl last year, and in that Super Bowl week, there's about a 505 or so million dollars of economic activity. Uh, PolyMet alone will bring that economic boom to northeastern Minnesota every year for a minimum of 20 years. That's good paying jobs. We can do both. We can have great paying jobs, mine copper nickel, and keep our environment and water clean. In fact, we demand that. Joe Radinovich. Yeah, you know, there are two uh, candidates that are pro-mining this race. I think that uh, projects that can meet or exceed the federal standards uh, should be, and, and state standards, should be able to move forward. But there's a difference between being for mining companies and being for miners. And the issue here is that when we talk about what miners need, we need to make sure that we protect uh, you know, their ability to uh, adapt in the face of many of the changes that we're seeing in the industry. For instance, you know, in, in 1980, there were 14,500 iron miners producing 40 million tons of iron ore. Uh, it, t- today, there's still 40 million tons being produced, but it takes 4,000 iron miners. And so making sure that we're not only you know, uh, open to these processes, but that we're really focusing on the people who are doing the work is probably one of the most important things about this. You know, Mike, uh, I sat uh, uh, with uh, miners and their families at four, on four separate occasions, public hearings, two at Masai. East High School, and I spoke uh, publicly, uh, one at the, the deck, and then we ha- had a rally in, in the city of Virginia. We met at the baseball field, and I walked shoulder to shoulder with uh, miners and their families to Virginia High School and publicly spoke in support of copper nickel mining. Um, so I'm not sure where Joe was at the time. And but yet the, we never see you at any bottom, contract rallies or steel dumping rallies the bottom or anything line like that. Is I, I'm the only one that supports uh, uh, copper nickel mining just yesterday. I was in Grand Marais. That's not true, Pete. Joe, Joe, just hang on. Go ahead, Pete. Wait a minute. Just yesterday, I was in Grand Marais, Minnesota. Spoke to an individual who was at, with Joe, talking about copper nickel mining with his supporters. At the end of the conversation, he waffled on his support for copper nickel mining because they were giving him grief for supporting it. Uh, Joe and I was in Grand Marais, uh, Minnesota yesterday. Let's let Joe, Joe respond. That's that's like you can make up a story about something. I mean, that's Joe, that's ridiculous. Pete. Joe, I was in Grand Marais, Minnesota yesterday. <laughs> so what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> okay, but you just said that's not true. <laughs> no, well, I said, what I said wasn't true was that um, I can't remember now. I mean, no, I didn't even start. The, off I didn't even start the story, <laughs> yeah. and he said it wasn't <laughs> true. <laughs> well, it's just that kind of race, I guess. Here we're eleven yeah. days away from the election. Uh, uh, well, let me ask the question this way. I mean, the district is so big. And there are so many different regions. It, it ranges from the, you know, the exurbs of the Twin Cities uh, to the Iron Range to Duluth. There are small towns, everything in between. How do you effectively represent everyone? Or how do you look at the job? Do you, do you have to represent everyone? Or do you try to represent the majority? And Joe yeah. Radinovich, start well, with you. Well, I think that the, the role of the congressperson in, in this district is to represent everyone. And this district is large and it is diverse. And it's uh, many different regions and different economies in a lot of ways. Uh, but there are a lot of things that unite us. And what unites us, I think, is that everybody is trying to make sure that uh, they can send their kid to college for an affordable rate. Everybody is trying to make sure that they can find affordable health care. They want their Social Security and Medicare protected. They want to make sure, I think, a lot of people I hear from uh, want to remove the corrupting influence of secret money from our political system. And these are things that I hear from Republicans, Democrats, and independents. So there's a lot that unites us. Pete Stauber. Yeah, you know, my life experience as a police officer for 23 years, a small business owner for 28 years, and a professional hockey player, when I go out uh, to the district, uh, I'm living my message. They understand when I talk to small businesses, which are the engine of our economy, when I talk about how hard it is to actually have to reach into your back pocket to make payroll when the cash flow is short, when I talk to uh, individuals about uh, uh, working hard and and trying to find a way uh, for all of us uh, to live. But you're talking about the ability in the 8th Congressional District, which is a diverse uh, uh, district, but the bottom line is when I go out and about The people are excited uh, about the potential for this economy. And I can can tell you this, that, you know, every, uh, Mike, every generation has its challenges, and ours does too. But I firmly believe that our best days are yet to come. And that's why I'm running for this, uh, this position, to make sure that our children and grandchildren have a, have, have a more prosperous, more free uh, United States than the greatest generation gave us. 
Well, let me ask you uh, this question. It's come up, uh, and there was a hearing in Duluth this morning in court about these emails yep. that you uh, s apparently sent back and forth with the Republican camp campaign committee on your uh, county uh, email system. Uh, why not just release those emails and get the whole thing passed yeah. and get it over the, with? The, the county had the responsibility to look into this matter. Mike, they did so. They found no wrongdoing and cleared the matter. Is there something in the emails, though, that's super secret? Or you know, I support the county's response to the Dayton's administration's uh, non-binding opinion. And we look at this from the, from the bird's eye view. Uh, the fact of the matter is there was a resolution on the county board that failed uh, reference this matter. And my opponent, Joe Rodinovich, called St. Louis County commissioners and begged them to support the resolution, and he did it twice. Uh, to me, that's despic despicable and try attempting to obstruct the process. Joe, you cannot deny sure I can. you that's called St. Louis County commissioners. Sure. Right, Joe Rodinovich on this issue, and then we'll... Yeah, so, well, here, so number one, he didn't answer the question about why he won't release his emails. Uh, the state uh, said that the county is interpreting the statute wrong. What's going on right now is that Pete is hiding behind a state law that says that uh, representatives can communicate with their constituents, obviously in private, to protect everybody's interests. But what's going on is he's communicating with political interest in Washington, D.C., and we don't know what the content of those emails are. He was not cleared of any wrongdoing. The, I the, certainly no, was. He was in violation of county policy. I was not. That's, that's exactly what you... Did. That's, that's an immutable fact, Pete. So just he, finish. Yeah, he was in, in violation of county policy. They said that that there was no further review needed, but that was, uh, as far as we know, not reviewed by anybody else, only his political allies on the board. And so the interest here is in the public's uh, ability to know what their representatives are doing behind closed doors. Pete repeatedly wants to bring up uh, the, the fact that, you know, he says that character is what you do when nobody's looking, and yet he could end this, he could end the taxpayer expense in trying to defend this in a lawsuit just by releasing the 15 or 16 emails and letting the public know what he was doing with the National Republicans. Was he okay. trying to undermine, you know, Mike, Social Security well, Let's not speculate, but go Mike, ahead. Mike, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, it's Joe and his allies that are bringing this suit. It's purely political, uh, partisan. He's a, he's currently in a floundering campaign, and this is this is uh, the unfortunate part of politics that uh, that desperate candidates and desperate campaign campaigns do. Editorial boards and people who value public transparency and accountability have been sounding off on how egregious it is that St. Louis County won't follow the advisory opinion of the state about how they're misinterpreting the statute. The issue here is that the public has a right to know what's going on with their money and their resources. And this clearly exists outside of the public's interest to protect privacy. This is Pete communicating with special interests in Washington, D.C. We want to know what it was about. Mike, this is, a, this is a, in 2006, then Senate candidate uh, Amy Klobuchar went through something very similar to this, where the, where the Hennepin County uh, advisory stated uh, that uh, she should do something, and uh, she didn't, and uh, Amy Klobuchar is a sitting U.S. Senator. Okay, Let's uh, see what Amy Klobuchar says about uh, that. But. Joe Radinovich, uh, the issue has come up, as you well know, in uh, TV ads and, and elsewhere about your parking tickets and a, a, mar a paraphernalia, marijuana paraphernalia citation. Uh, I had a question from a listener. Is there anything else in your record that you need to come clean about? No, and, and this is the thing, is my record is public, right? And I've answered all of these questions over and over again about, you know, the, the parking and speeding tickets, and I, and I regret them, right? I mean, I, I shouldn't have had as many as I did, and I take responsibility for that. And I've uh, owned up to this uh, dismissed paraphernalia charge from, a marijuana paraphernalia charge from when I was 18 years old, uh, and I've taken accountability for that. I've made mistakes in my life, and I think that makes me more human. The, the, the real issue here is that, you know, having done all of these things, as I've done, uh, Pete still can't be transparent about the emails, and most of us are wondering what's in those emails uh, that, that's so bad that he wouldn't just let them out and stop the county having to defend this mess. Mike, the, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, Joe didn't take accountability. He only paid his criminal fines when KSTP Park caught, tickets. caught him. <laughs> then he paid his criminal fines. And at the, the debate in Duluth, uh, the Duluth News Tribune uh, editor Chuck Frederick, uh, when they were interviewing him, said, is there anything else? And he said, no. Later, we found out there was this drug issue. No, no, that was, no, and, no. That, and, and, and so that's why they brought it up at the debate. Um, Joe talked, uh, talked about character. We have to look at, at uh, 
uh, character uh, plays a big part in this. You know, it the, Duluth, does. the Duluth News Tribune, uh, I served 22 years over two decades as a police officer for the city of Duluth. After 22 years, the Duluth News Tribune looked into my personnel file. They didn't find one complaint from a citizen or one complaint from a co-worker. And that, it should tell the listeners that Pete Stauber uh, was empathetic and caring in people's darkest hours as a police officer. Joe Radinovich. Yeah, so the, the, the fines that I paid late were parking tickets. And again, I regret that I had parking tickets and paid them late, but that's a fact of life for a lot of people who, you know, park in places where parking is tough, right? Um, the the marijuana paraphernalia ticket that I got when I was 18 years old was dismissed. Um, it could have been expunged from my record. My <laughs> my fiance is a prosecutor. She informed me of that very recently. I wish she'd told me that six months ago. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I've been open and honest about all those things. I've made mistakes in my life. I've you know learned and I've grown, and that's part of uh, being a real human being. But again, this coming back to this email thing, it seems bizarre to me that Pete just won't release the 15 emails. If there's nothing to hide in them, why won't he release them? Joe has to be uh, transparent here. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, Joe Radinovich would still be living in the Metro had Rick Nolan not vacated his seat. Uh, and that's a fact. Uh, in, on December 31st, Joe has uh, had written uh, inf uh, information uh, to a uh, uh, House candidate donating to his campaign, and he gave an address and an apartment in Minneapolis. He has told the public that he never lived in Minneapolis. He commuted. Uh, this is, the, this is the, the history with Joe and not being uh, a transparent, and people see it throughout the district. Okay. And, and I, my goal is to, uh, I want to, these last couple of weeks, uh, I want to really get out and meet a lot of people to really show them because the character uh, in, in my life is, is, uh, comes about from my experiences, both good and bad, the hardships, the successes. Okay. You know, being a father, Mike, is one of the proudest things for me. And I can, I can share with you that uh, those of us who are parents, for example, never sleep good until all their kids are in bed. And that's what happened to me last night. And so this is resonating with the people. So character is how you behave when no one else is looking. Okay, let me, and the only time success comes before sweat is in the dictionary. Let's have uh, Joe Radinovich give a response, and I have another question. Yeah, yeah. So again, if character matters, then why won't Pete Stauber release the emails and stop these lawsuits? Uh, I think that's in the public interest. And the other thing is that, you know, Pete, my dad uh, was a construction electrician, and if he was lucky, he was working two hours away from home. Many times he was working in North Dakota or in uh, Montana, and he had apartments in those places. I have never voted anywhere other than the Crosby area to Minnesota. I have lived in Crosby my entire life. I have worked in the Twin Cities. I'm very proud of the work that I've done here, and on behalf of my, my good friend and somebody I think is going to be an excellent mayor, Jacob Fry. Uh, but these are ridiculous smears, Joe, and it's clear the desperation you can't... Well, uh, let me just ask a question uh, on sort of on this broad uh, character issue that came from a listener. When you're facing a tough decision, what personal experience do you use to help you decide what the next step should be? And uh, Pete Stauber, let's start with you. So a as a police officer, small business owner, husband and father, you, there's tough choices almost on a daily basis. You go back to your experience and you do what's right. Uh, experience matters, life experience matters, and uh, as a police officer, for example, on the city of Duluth, we had to make instantaneous decisions, and those good decisions you make in those, in those uh, urgent moments, you have to rely on your experience to make them, and uh, when you have uh, experience as a police officer, some of those really immediate, really life-altering uh, life, uh, decisions have to be made instantaneously. So I go back to my, my life. I go back to the experiences that I have uh, uh, been blessed with in my life to make those uh, decisions, Mike. Joe Radinovich. I put myself in someone else's shoes, and that's uh, easy enough for me to do because I have dealt with a great deal of adversity in my life. When I was 16 years old, um, my, my life was pretty good at that point. I came home from track practice on March 18th. I met a family member uh, shoot himself trying to take his own life and 11 months after that my mother was murdered uh, by a separate family member who took his own life then as well and I've struggled through four years uh, after that and uh, that was the period of time when I got that ticket and you know I made it through um, but I recognize that not everybody had the resources that I did when I needed that I had teachers around me who were supporting me uh, who lifted me up who taught me that the value of public education is about more than textbooks and classrooms 
I had a good health insurance because my dad had a good union electrician job. And I think that everybody deserves access to those things in life. And for me, um, putting myself in someone else's shoes and holding myself accountable to the values that I've always uh, grown up with and that I've learned through good times and bad is how I make decisions. Let me ask another question from a listener. Uh, This listener said, since the UN panel released its uh, climate change report a couple of weeks ago that called for really some big changes in in a hurry to uh, make a difference, what, if anything, would you support to address climate change? And Pete Stauber, start with you. Yeah, I read that report too, Mike, and and uh, it's an issue that we have to look at. I know that uh, Joe, neither Joe nor I are uh, scientists. Uh, we have to look at what are the causes and how can we uh, uh, reduce the emissions. And uh, I think that it's a it's a great healthy discussion because at the scientific level, uh, there's there's some discussions on what we can put forth that. Uh, can uh, can slow the process, and uh, I'm open to to uh, discussions and 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 uh, and learn from the scientists because, uh, like I say, neither Joe or our scientists. Joe Radinovich. Climate change is real. Uh, there is no discussion anymore, and there hasn't been, frankly, a discussion for a long time. Uh, the overwhelming majority of scientists believe one thing about this, and that it's happening, and that it's caused by uh, greenhouse gases like uh, CO2 and like methane, and uh, that it's largely uh, caused by human activity, right? And so we have to be able to, number one, uh, mitigate the damages that are already being done. I think that that looks like reducing uh, greenhouse gases, sequestering carbon, uh, making sure that we, uh, you know, continue to advance uh, sensible and sustainable um, policies that will reduce those gases. We also need to invest, I think, in uh, renewable forms of energy to continue to diversify the energy basket. And uh, beyond that, we're also, frankly, at this point, because people have been dragging their feet on this issue for so long, going to have to look at adaptation techniques. I think that that's the real uh, dilemma here. And, and everybody, every expert agrees on this. There is no conversation to have anymore. Pete? Well, I, I, I'll re- reiterate what I just said. I said we have to look at things to, to, to make sure that we leave uh, not only this country but this world in better shape than we got it. And so uh, I'm, I'm always willing to uh, uh, look at things, and, and I'm a perpetual learner. Uh, another question from a listener. Are any new gun laws needed after recent mass shootings? For example, do you support background checks on all gun sales? And I think this person is looking for a yes or no answer. Joe Radinovich, start with you. Yes. You support background checks? I do, yes. Pete Stauber. We have background checks. As Mike, as a police officer for 23 years, uh, I can say this while off-duty in 1995, I was shot in the head in downtown Duluth. A few years later, while on-duty, a perpetrator in a hostage situation got the jump on me, pulled a handgun within five feet, pulled the trigger, and by the grace of God, it malfunctioned, and I was literally fighting for my life. I still support our Second Amendment to have law, individual law-abiding citizens the right to keep and bear arms. There is not a person that I know that wants a career criminal, a drug addict, somebody who's going through crisis, or others that shouldn't possess or have a firearm. We need to keep those firearms out of those criminals' hands. And one of the things that I'm very proud of in St. Louis County, uh, we have, a, we have a, um, a lead prosecutor, our county attorney, Mark Rubin, who, who will not uh, plead down any gun crime. And I'm very proud of that because he understands and we understand uh, the importance uh, of reducing violence in our, in our communities. And so in St. Louis County, there's no pleading down gun crimes, Mike. Joe Radinovich. There are large loopholes in our background check system, and I think that that's the spirit of the question that was asked, and that wasn't the answer that we got from Pete Stauber. The NRA is spending $200,000 to beat me right now, and I think it's in part because um, most gun owners recognize that we can have sensible uh, reforms that protect people. I mean, we've seen now uh, mass shootings in Las Vegas uh, about a year ago. There were 450 people shot within five minutes because somebody was able to go buy multiple assault style weapons to outfit them with bump stocks and high capacity magazines and to wreck carnage on the streets of Las Vegas. And I think that in a civilized society, we can have both uh, protection of the Second Amendment. I'm an avid hunter and have been my whole life, have plenty of guns myself, and also sensible gun reform. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, I think uh, Joe and I agree on this. Well, it sounds like he's, he wants to have background checks for private sales, though. Well, let's talk about private sales. So my 86-year-old father, who's uh, towards the end of his life, let's say, so what Joe wants is when my father hands his 
firearm, his, his deer rifle that he's been using for 50, 60 years, to my 18-year-old, that has to be a background check. That's what he's advocating for. Let's, we, there are sensible uh, uh, alternatives and sens sensible solutions. And I'll give you an example. My good friend Gordon Ramsey, former chief of police in Duluth, uh, now in Kansas, we, he, in Kansas, in the state of Kansas, uh, in order to carry uh, concealed, you have to meet some minimum requirements, which doesn't include training. You know, in Minnesota, to carry concealed, there's a training course you have to go to because it's a, it's a huge responsibility to carry concealed. And so uh, somebody from uh, Kansas comes to the state of Minnesota. That concerns me because so, they don't have the training. So would you support that nationally then? Did it have some yeah, kind be, of training? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about it, uh, uh, supporters of our Second Amendment talk about they want it to be like a driver's license. That's fine, but all all states have to have consistent training. Like we know, uh, and I've, I've put two of my uh, children through driver's ed right now, we know that there there's uh, the lecture and in classroom and then uh, street driving and so we know that uh, that they uh, young drivers are put through a course and we can uh, expect them when they go to the state of Wisconsin Mike to understand the right. rules too so uh, uh, historically uh, there's a uh, we can have a great discussion on that and I'm willing to do that and that's why I want to go to Congress Mike okay Joe Radinovich when we talk about private sales, the biggest, uh, most glaring loophole there is with gun shows. And that's what we're talking about cracking down on first, so that people can't go to a gun show where there are thousands and thousands of uh, weapons, oftentimes hundreds of sellers, and go through and pick out any gun they want without having to go through a background check. That's the first line, right? We don't need to worry necessarily yet about private sales between, or, you know, handing a gun down from your grandpa to the other thing. We can figure that in but the that, future. But that's but the what first your group point, wants to do. My group, Pete. Yeah, what group? Your allies. My, my al you and your allies want to restrict uh, giving uh, family members guns. You and your allies, that's what you're reporting. That's what you're saying. That, what allies, Pete? The NRA is spending $200,000 to defeat me. They haven't advocated for one single solution in the face of Nancy the Nancy Pelosi's super PAC. Nancy Pelosi's super PAC isn't... Uh, is, <laughs> it wants to defeat me. I don't have any support from Nancy Pelosi's yes, super PAC. Yes, you do. That it's the no, dark no one can see you giving the air quotes right now, Joe, Pete. Joe. Okay. Um, Ten years ago, uh, the economy was in shambles. Uh, the big banks were out of money, going bankrupt. The entire financial system was on the verge of collapse. Do you think we have adequate regulations now to protect against another crash like that, or do we need more? Joe Radinovich. I, I think that what we need to do is make sure that we are not undermining sensible regulations that were put in place uh, in the wake of that crash. Too often what's happened in American history is that we get too far from those disasters and we start to cater to the big banks and special interests like my opponent is taking support from and undermine important protections. So we are, um, you know, when we see a, a crash like the one we saw in, in late 2008, I mean, that devastates retirements. I was at a central state's pension fund the other day uh, where Teamsters, because of, through no fault of their own because big banks crashed the the economy here in this country are going to have 50 percent cuts to their pensions these are the consequences for deregulation of the banking and financial sector services pete stauber uh, the the dodd frank act uh, when i talked to uh, local community lenders and banks throughout the district they said for them it was a disaster we've had throughout minnesota uh, a couple a hundred banks, small community banks, closed because of the uh, onerous regulations put on them. I think that we have to be uh, very sensible and uh, logical and when we place rules and policies uh, throughout this country. And that's just one example of going overboard. But look look what's happening right now. Uh, the President Trump, for every rule or policy he brings forth, he takes out about 22. And look what the economy is doing. Look what the, it's doing for consumer confidence. Look what it's doing to small business business and manufacturing surging unemployment is at historic lows. I think that's a good thing. Is that because of uh, a lack of regulations? Joe Radinovich, is that why the economy is booming? No, the, the economy has had uninterrupted growth since the, the mid-Obama administration when we came out of the, uh, the financial uh, crash that was uh, a result of Republican deregulation. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that President Obama inherited an economy in flames, uh, which is why the deficit was so high when he took office. He reduced the deficit, I think, by about half over the course of his term and also put sensible regulation in place. We're talking about the big banks. You know what? I, I, I support uh, credit unions and their ability to make sure 
that these regulations don't uh, unduly impact them. They're an important segment of the, you know, the local banking industry. But really what's happening is that re uh, Republicans in Washington, D.C. are not interested in the credit unions. They're interested in big financial institutions on Wall Street and in other banking centers across the country. And they are the institutions that gambled with our mortgage debt. They're the, the institutions that heated up the economy for their own benefit. And when it came time for the crash, we bailed them out while people like the, the Teamsters who have that central state's pension that crashed are going to take 50% cuts. This is the fundamental problem with the economy. It's that it's not that the rich people don't have enough money. It's that we don't protect people on Main Street when it comes time to do it. Uh, Pete uh, Minnesota eight uh, families on average, uh, because of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, are going to uh, be saving $2,500. That's $2,500 in their pocket. I understand Joe wants to take that away from them, and uh, his leadership in Washington want to reverse the tax cuts. They want to raise taxes. They want to uh, take a sledgehammer to our health care system. They want to impeach the president. I'm saying... Our economy is going very well. And so this is just a start. I think this is just okay. a start, Mike, to this economy. And we're just getting going. And I want to go to Congress uh, to keep it going. And, and, and that okay. small businesses, Mike, can make it. And, and the entrepreneurial spirit can flourish. Quick. Quick response from Joe Rodinovich, then I'll let you guys make a closing statement. Yeah, yeah. I've never uh, once talked about impeaching the president. I think that the Mueller investigation should continue unimpeded for what it's worth. And I think that it's and so do pretty, I. produced plenty of results. And Pete, so do I. Pete, both his campaign manager and his lawyer and are, so do are, I. are facing 16 convictions. And we haven't heard one thing from you about that. But anyway, uh, here's what I believe is I believe that this is about Main Street America. We need to make sure that we're protecting the people on Main Street, not the big banks, not the millionaires and billionaires, not the 1%. This is about an economy where every Everybody benefits, and that's the fundamental difference between Pete Stauber and I. Uh, Pete Stauber, I, 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 we're just out of time, so I'll give you like 40 seconds. For okay. Those. Thanks for having us, Mike. Joe, thanks for being here. The fundamental difference between uh, Joe Rodinovich and Pete Stauber is Pete Stauber believes in the people believes in small businesses. Joe, through his limited life experience outside politics, always goes to the government for answers. And that's the fundamental difference. He goes to the government uh, for health care. He goes to the government for many other things. I believe in the people. I believe in Minnesotans. I want to go to Congress and legislate from the lens of Main Street, Minnesota. And my blue-collar, common-sense, conservative message is resonating. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. And Joe Radinovich, last... Uh 40 seconds. Yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and here's the big deal is that we've got an opportunity to make sure that we protect people going forward. The economy is changing very rapidly, and the answer is not to make sure that the wealthiest people among us have access to more money. The answer for us going forward is to make sure that we protect Social Security and Medicare, college affordability, and ensure that everybody has access to affordable health care in this country. We have the ability to do it. I don't take a dime in corporate PAC money, and I'm the only one in this race who has a chance to win that can say that. That is Democrat Joe Radinovich. He was joined here by Republican Pete Stauber. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. They thank are you, running Joe. for Congress in Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, uh, the northeast part of the state, uh, ranging from the Twin Cities exurbs all the way up to the Canadian border. Great program. If you haven't voted yet, get out and vote. Election Day is November 6th. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you later. With eight days before the midterm elections, other debate coverage here on C-SPAN includes tonight at 8 Eastern, live...